Welcome to Feminist Question Time, brought to you by Women's Declaration International, the leading global organisation defending women's sex-based rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. There's more information on the website womensdeclaration.com, where you'll find our Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, which has been signed by 33,540. 34 people from 160 countries and is supported by 466 organisations. We have over 100 volunteer activists, including 53 country contacts um, engaged in defending women's rights. Today, we have Sheila Jeffries from the UK talking on with a talk, We Can't Save Gender and Abolish Transgenderism. Then we are going to hear from Anne Menashe from USA on being cancelled and how I'm fighting back. And then we're going to hear from Susan Smith from Four Women Scotland from Scotland. And she's going to give us an update on what's happening in Scotland. I'm very, very, very pleased to welcome Sheila Jeffries, who's going to give our first talk. Um, Sheila Jeffries is an academic and activist and has written 12 books about women's rights, uh, women's liberation, lesbian feminism, and uh, is a founder member of WDI, Women's Declaration International. She's written uh, several books on transgenderism and on gender. And uh, she's now going to give us a talk we can't save gender and abolish transgenderism. So welcome, Sheila. Thank you very much for coming. In the wonderful international and broad feminist campaign against the politics of gender identity that we are all involved in, there is an unspoken issue that I consider to be of huge importance. And this is whether we can effectively oppose this men's rights movement if we do not recognize that the problem of men imitating women is integrally bound up with the practices of subordination that women are required to adopt under male domination. These practices are called femininity or gender, and it is this that transvestites imitate. I will use the term transvestites to apply to the men who are masochistically sexually excited by doing what they call gender expression or wearing women's knickers. I use this term because it's the term used throughout the 20th century by the sexologists, the scientists of sex, to refer to men with this particular sexual fetish. And it's important not to use language which suggests that men can really become women by some alchemical process. The vast majority of men who have gender identities are just those who are excited by such things as shaving their legs in front of the mirror, for instance, a practice that symbolizes subordination for them. As our new feminist movement develops, and it is developing and it's very exciting, many women are joining who are fiercely determined to oppose the gender identity rights movement, and, and it's good to see this. And many of these new feminists though, are newly involved and not aware of the full extent of the radical feminist critique of gender. They may see their activism on this issue, as quite separate from the ways in which women are expected to dress, depilate, make up, and so on. If the femininity that women do is seen as separate, somehow more real than that which men do, the problem of transvestism could be seen as men unreasonably muscling in on practices that are naturally those of women, rather than engaging in sexual play with women's oppression. Men who adopt gender identities engage in a variety of behaviors they associate with women. They pretend to have female body parts or try to acquire them by surgery, including wombs, which some surgeons are now seeking to offer. They imitate what they see as women's behavior, such as knitting. There's quite a fascination with pink knitting. They adopt what they see as feminine ways of holding their bodies, taking up space. And of course they engage in what they see as women's beauty practices. All of these things give sexual satisfaction. And of course it can be very hard for them to hide their erections when they're engaged in them. I shall talk today about their adoption of what they call femininity, i.e. clothes, makeup, beauty practices such as depilation, 
ways of moving, sitting and standing that they see as appropriate for women. The difference between men doing femininity and women doing femininity is not that men do it for masochistic sexual excitement and women do it naturally. Men do do it for masochistic sexual excitement, that is true. But women do it because of cultural requirements and various degrees of force often applied from a very early age. There is nothing natural about it. You have probably seen little girls in parks standing at the bottom of trees while their brothers play in the branches. I certainly have. The girls are wearing short skirts, which will impede movement and show their knickers if they try to climb, and their parents will likely discourage them. They will probably also have unsuitable shoes. These little girls are crippled in their adventurousness, their comfort in movement and their bodies, and ultimately, I would argue, their minds from a very early age. These constraints create brain binding for female children. Now, this is just an example of transgender resources online. To see what the transvestites understand to be the practices of femininity, it's useful to consult the resources available online. There are very many training websites, videos and courses online for transvestites as part of the now immense industry of transgenderism, which services these men's fetishes from knickers with holes for the penis, to pink dummies for adult babies. They offer a great deal of information about what they understand femininity to entail and make it clear they see it to be about subordination. The website Susan's Place, for instance, gives advice to men on how to imitate the way women walk. Women are told, for instance, that they should rest their forearm on their shoulder bag. It says, rest your forearm on it with a limp wrist, something women often forget to do, I suspect. Men are advised on how to wear high heel shoes because these are very important to womanhood. They should, the website says, let the ankle wobble. This is a natural tendency, let it happen. If the ankle wobbles, it shows weakness, a truly feminine characteristic. Keeping the ankle stiff will be a dead giveaway as it just doesn't look very feminine. So there you have it. Femininity is simply weakness. So it is very sexually exciting for a masochist to adopt it. On these sites, men are trained in how to sit. It's explained that taking up space is about power. So only men should do that. Only men should man spread, for instance. When they're being women, they must try to take up very little space. They must keep their knees together or cross their legs. There is a great deal of evidence that men adopt what they see as feminine behaviors, shoes, clothing, makeup, because it represents the delights of masochism for them. They are voluntarily humiliating themselves and prepared to put a lot of time into learning how to do it. Every instruction as well as every step in painful shoes can give them delicious erections. Nonetheless, there are women, even feminists, who do not see these practices as being culturally imposed upon themselves as part of their subordination. They see them as unacceptable only if men adopt them. But for women, they see them as natural and about choice. This is not surprising. Women are indoctrinated their whole lives by popular culture, parents, educators, the law, medicine, religion, in the naturalness of femininity. It could feel very confronting, even scary, to step out into the strange world of bare-faced women with their feet on the ground and face being ignored or traduced by men for their disobedience. Now, I want to talk about femininity. The feminists who consider that we um, oppose transgenderism without opposing femininity may not be aware that the critique of beauty practices lies at the very foundation of radical feminism. So I'll go over this now. It's the understanding of radical feminism that what is seen under male domination as natural and inevitable, the behaviors of femininity and masculinity, actually represent a system of power relations. Masculinity is the behavior of male power, 
It is the behavior of comfort, dignity, the taking up of space, the right to keep the body covered and not have to perform what I call the sexual corvée. And it represents power and authority and full human status. Femininity, on the other hand, is the behavior of female subordination. It includes performing what I call the sexual corvée. The sexual corvée consists of the range of practices that women are culturally expected to perform on their bodies in order to show their second class status and sexually excite their overseers, the dominant sex class of men. I call it the sexual corvée in reference to the corvée which was performed by the peasants in Europe under the political system of feudalism. Corvée is the system commonly used throughout history but best known from the time of feudalism in Europe, in which the peasants or serfs were required to work the land of the landowner for a certain number of days yearly with no pay so that the landlord could profit. Women are required to do all of this work to themselves. Women are required to do complex and painful things to their bodies, as well as buying the toxic chemicals with which to do them. And of course, they don't get paid for any of this. The shopping costs women time and money, but the work of application takes a great deal of time too. A study by Marks and Spencers estimated that the average woman takes 20 minutes per day doing ordinary makeup and 40 minutes for going out socializing. That is, as I always explain, several years in a lifetime and quite enough to learn a difficult language like Korean, which would be much more useful. There are many other activities required which all take time. Depilation, eyebrow threading, the application of full snails in beauty parlors and bleaching, and um, anal bleaching rather, pumping up lips and other parts of the body with fillers, tattooing, piercing, Botox. The array of treatments that women have to pay to have applied to their body, most of which are painful and take a good deal of time, is very extensive. Men, on the other hand, may skip out of the door in the morning barefaced, having done nothing to transform themselves, having done nothing to please women's eyes or to show their deference. I argue that the beauty practices required of women should be included within the United Nations understanding of harmful cultural practices. Harmful cultural practices are those which do not fit easily into conventional understandings of women's rights or into the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. The paradigmatic harmful cultural practice is female genital mutilation. The practices are defined by being harmful to women and girls, performed for the benefit of men, and justified by tradition. Beauty practices fit these criteria, though they're not usually included in the lists in UN documents, which include such practices as child marriage and breast ironing and so on. The UN concept of harmful cultural practices is created out of a cultural bias. Therefore, it does not include any practices which take place in Western countries because women are educated in the West and seem to have a choice. In fact, of course, there are plenty of harmful cultural practices in the West which are not alleviated by a higher standard of living and education. The bodies of women and girls are cut up in the West in ways which suit the interests of men and male power and are brutal even compared with those in Africa or the Middle East. Breast augmentation is a vicious and dangerous practice, as is labiaplasty, in which women have parts of their labia removed to make them resemble the women in pornography more closely. And because the new regime required of women in the West, in which their vulvas are shaved, reveals what masculine culture considers undesirable. Presently, teenage girls are being subjected to drug and surgical treatment to make them into boys under a woman-hating idea that has taken over the culture, that girls who reject beauty practices cannot really be female and must have their bodies attacked and altered at all costs. These practices are just as brutal as many of those seen as unacceptable elsewhere, such as placing bands around the necks of girls to give them giraffe necks or isolating them in menstruation huts when they're bleeding or fattening them up for marriage. All of these practices, whether in the East or the West, are culturally imposed upon women and girls. 
Men only engage in them in very unusual circumstances, usually for sexual satisfaction. The harmful cultural practices approach understands beauty practices as a tool and imposition of male domination rather than something natural, essentially and uniquely the domain and pleasure of women. It is a political rather than an individual explanation. This explanation goes against everything though that girls and women are taught and can be quite hard for many women to accept. Some will say that in fact they choose depilation, high heeled shoes, makeup or other harmful practices. There is increasing understanding among many feminists that it's unreasonable to explain practices of violence against women, such as pornography or prostitution, as being the result of women's choice. The liberal feminist approach, in which harms to women are blamed upon women through saying it's women's choice, obscures the forces of male domination which set up these industries and induct women and girls into them for men's satisfaction. In relation to harmful cultural practices, arguments as to choice are not really relevant. In the UN understanding, they are seen as imposed culturally upon women and girls in such a way that there is no room for choice. The overwhelming expectation of the beauty industry, women's media, family, workplaces, popular culture, and the everyday demands of men create a cultural imperative that women and girls engage in them. Another example of a harmful cultural practice imposed upon women is the requirement of nakedness. Probably the clearest indication of difference in status between men and women is that women are expected to show the entirety of their buttocks in swimwear and men wear board shorts. But I'll talk about everyday shorts because I think there's less recognition of the shocking nature of the difference here. So basically, um, under male domination, nakedness symbolizes lack of power, lack of dignity, and women are forced to be at least partly naked. Men are not naked because being clothed symbolizes power and dignity, and men are clothed. The, the differences are really, 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 really clear. You can walk down any street into any room and you will see the difference between nakedness, not nakedness. Now, women are generally required to wear shorts that are tighter and with short leg lengths, in some cases exposing parts of the buttocks, because these please men's eyes and are seen as suitable for the class of women which has less claim to dignity. What other reason could there be for men's shorts being six inches longer than those of women almost always? Actually, I think here they're a bit longer. I see heterosexual couples approaching the beach in the seaside town in which I live and the shorts of the men and women are a study in power difference. So you see here, Harry and Megan in their new Netflix doco. Fortunately, this photograph was in the newspaper this morning and I thought it was very suitable. Uh, you see that poor Megan has to expose all of her thighs and wear quite tight clothes uh, because, of course, looseness is about dignity and tightness is about showing men your body. Whereas Harry, who is both in the ruling class in terms of being um, royal, as well as in the ruling class, as well as being a man, can have loose clothes, covering clothes and be uh, and feel dignified. Now, feminine uh, beauty practices serve two main purposes. They mark out the members of the inferior sex class so that everyone knows who is the man. In this way, they create sexual difference. In a hierarchical system, it's very important to know who is on the top and who is on the bottom. Beauty practices mark out persons worthy of respect and those who are not. Also, they're designed to create sexual excitement, to make of the public world, as I argue, an outdoor brothel. They enable men to exist in a fever of arousal at work, on public transport, in the street. In a book called The Psychology of Clothes from the 1930s, for instance, a psychologist named Flugel explained that when a man heard the sound of a woman's high heels behind him walking down the street, he would go into the first stage of, of arousal. I presume that means erection. So men uh, admit themselves very clearly what these beauty practices do for them and the excitements that they create. Women's performance of, of femininity is a practice of deference. It shows humility and obedience to their social superiors, the sex class of men. 
and women who refuse to show deference do get punished. It may be simply a men saying, as they used to in the workplace when I was young, and maybe they're not allowed to now, that it would be lovely to see their workmates' legs, or if she once wears a skirt, that it is lovely to see her legs. That may not happen anymore, but it certainly used to happen. I uh, can't imagine anything like that being said to men. Um, thus, um, women are trained into obedience. If you refuse to comply, men will deliver quite imaginative insults. Uh, for instance, on a men's rights website, I was described as looking like a bulldog, which is fine for me because I very much like dogs. Now, I became fully aware of the way the pressure upon women to express deference works when I had a fascinating conversation with a woman I met when I gave a talk in Queensland to the Women's Business Association Zonta. She was wearing lipstick and she was in her 60s. She told me that she'd been a strong feminist in her youth and did not wear lipstick, but started to wear it at the age of 60 because she realized she had become invisible. I told her she was not invisible to me. I enjoyed talking to her and found her very interesting, but she was not interested in being visible to women. She meant that men now ignored her. She was probably used to some attention because she'd been attractive in a way that men valued. But in age, she needed to make a gesture of availability to bring back their attention. And this was an extraordinarily uh, clear indication to me of the enormous pressure on women to get men's attention and to do the practices that will get that attention. Lipstick, um, I have explained elsewhere, was associated with uh, prostitution in the West until the 1920s. Two historians of prostitution have explained that lipstick was first adopted in the period of the Ur of the Cordes, Babylon, by prostituted women. These women were slaves and made their lips look like engorged labia to indicate that they would perform oral sex. It was a marketing device. It only became ubiquitous in the West in the 20th century, in the period between the two world wars. My mother did not wear it in youth, but felt obliged to adopt it as an older woman. And in fact, uh, if I went out of the door wearing uh, lipstick in my teens, my father would say to me, you look like a whore. And there's nothing chosen about a practice which is now seen as necessary for women to be, to feel visible, meaning visible to men. That's not a chosen practice. Now, I want to talk about where the um, radical feminist approach came from, how it first became a crucial part of our movement. Um, feminists started the women's liberation movement, of course, in the 1970s by protesting beauty pageants and argued fiercely that women should not have to serve as sex objects for men. This uh, picture is from Andrea Dworkin's book, Woman Hating from 1974. So it's very early on. And what she, uh, what's in this picture, which she got done for her book, is it shows all the different practices that done to, are done to all the different bits of women's bodies. It's a handy diagram because you can work out what everybody is supposed to do from there, what women are supposed to do. Now, some things have changed but mostly through the adding of even more painful and humiliating practices, rather than any relaxation of the demands. Uh, nails, for instance, have to be rendered unfit for every ordinary use today, not just with painting, which was the case uh, um, in my day, painting with hazardous chemicals and shaping, but with the addition in a vast network of nail salons of fake nails, which are extraordinarily long and would make it impossible to caress a child, a pet or a lover, and certainly render getting dressed or cooking well nigh impossible. I mean, so now women can find that all their extremities are crippled, crippled by shoes at one end, crippled by nails on their hands and so on. The diagram only suggests that the mouth must be lipstick, but now there is a new fashion for women to plump up their lips. They use various chemicals so that they look even more precisely like in gorge labia. And they can even be dyed so that they're permanently luscious, sexualized, 
dark red. I think you probably have noticed that a lot of women have rather extraordinary lips on the television these days, <clears throat> sticking out in a very strange manner. And of course, the, using all of these, these chemical practices can be very dangerous and very harmful and very damaging. Now, a whole array of practices has been developed to enable women to look more like the women in pornography who have labiaplasties, who shave their genitals and so on. Now, both of those practices are normalized, as has anal bleaching. I remember I was in a classroom talking about uh, beauty practices, doing my lecture on beauty practices. And I said to my students who always taught me a great deal, uh, is there perhaps a practice that's quite new? This must have been 10 years ago or, or more. And one student put her hand up and said, um, anal bleaching. And I thought, I didn't know about that. I actually didn't know. So women are having to bleach their anuses so that they look nice to be looked at. Now, uh, Andrew Dworkin sees beauty practices as having extensive harmful effects on women's bodies and lives. Beauty practices, she says, are not only time wasting, expensive, painful to self-esteem. In fact, she says, standards of beauty describe in precise terms the relationship that an individual will have to her own body. They prescri proscribe her mobility, think high heeled shoes and tight skirts, her spontaneity, her posture, her gait, the uses to which she can put her body. And I do think that having the body constrained in this way must in the end affect the way that you are able to think, the boundaries of your imagination. And she says that these practices define precisely the dimensions of her physical freedom. It's crucial, I think, to that understanding. Because I do wonder how women are able to be totally imaginative, creative, create a new future for themselves in their minds if their bodies are tied down and completely constricted. Beauty practices aren't just some kind of interesting optional choice or extra. They fundamentally construct who a woman is and therefore how she's able to imagine because they construct, constrict her movements. They create the way in which she experiences her body and effect the binding of her mind. Right, this picture is also a little bit small, but you may be able to see me in it. I am sitting in the line just behind the table, third in from the right with my hand around the side of my face, looking extremely, depressed, I think it's reasonable to say. Uh, this was a student ball in about 1968. And the reason that I thought it was good to put this picture in is because uh, some people might think that, you know, us radical feminists, us lesbian feminists fall, you know, fully formed from the body of the goddess and that we were never down there doing beauty practices with other women. Well, of course we were down there doing beauty practices with other women. You can see I've got this um, long straight hair, which was also bleached, it was bleached mid golden sable. I had lots of different kinds of makeup on my eyes, probably false eyelashes as well, and so on. So suddenly I did all of those things. And I was one of those feminists in the 1970s whose life was transformed by the radical feminist analysis. The first feminist act many, many women engaged in was to give up beauty practices. Often this was done by stages. The first act might be to give up makeup. I can remember going into the Students' Union building at the University of Manchester after reading Kate Millett's Sexual Politics and becoming a feminist. I had no makeup on, deliberately did that, and seriously believed that no one would recognize me. I was so wedded to makeup at that time and did not go out without it. I was amazed when a young man walking past said, hello, Sheila. He could tell it was me even without my disguise. I think I said to him, how did you know it was me? Then of course, the next stage for me was to cut my hair to chin length and so on. I was hugely influenced by the women's liberation movement. It made me who I am today. And the first effect of it was that I abandoned harmful beauty practices. Um, men, of course, don't have to do these things. They can be barefaced, but women are culturally required to wear, wear makeup. And that's why I had so much makeup on in this picture. Now, after this great and wonderful women's liberation movement, when women were generally abandoning 
all of these practices, there was a massive back backlash. In the 1990s, the back, there was a considerable backlash against the movement. And there was the invention of something, for instance, called third wave feminism, which turned out to celebrate prostitution and pornography and beauty practices and called them all choice. So in fact, there weren't feminism at all. In the 2000s, there were slut walks, which were supposed to be empowering to women because we could all dress up as sluts and, and celebrate our slutness. The backlash was long and it was profound. Now that a new wave of feminism is at last underway, it's taking place in a context in which the literature, the ethics, the political analysis of the women's liberation movement has been mostly erased. Dworkin is remembered, but not her analysis of beauty practices. Today's feminists tend to pick and choose and beauty practices are not on the agenda for abolition. As a result of the backlash, it's very hard now to find an alternative in popular culture to what I call the sadomasochist romance that is heterosexuality. This picture is Madonna, uh, but it, I mean, there's so many thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pictures that are exactly like this from all over the place that uh, it could, would it's spoil for choice really. Um, so this is the sadomasochist romance. Observe any heterosexual couple or group on nights out, and you will see stark differences between the men and the women that show their difference in status. It's hard for me to understand why the glaring humiliation of women and flaunted power of men is not immediately clear from looking at any heterosexual couple on a night out. It's extraordinary how this display of stark and vicious inequality has been so normalized that it passes all the time without remark. It's seen as completely normal and natural. I find it painful to have to see this sort of display and I do not understand why all women do not find it so, why all women are not humiliated by having to see this. The photo of Madonna shows the problem. She played a crucial role in the backlash that took place against feminism in the 1990s. She was promoted as a perfect role model for girls and she's a perfect, yes, it is, as, as somebody's saying in the chat, it's a mild image. She's been doing extraordinary naked things now that she's 60, really extraordinary things. But yes, this is just an, a nice picture of her showing ordinary sadomasochism. She's a perfect illustration of the fact that heterosexuality is a sadomasochist romance in which power and subordination are eroticized as the motive force of the culture and certainly of heterosexual attraction. In this photo, she has absurdly crippling shoes in which she can barely stand. She's completely unstable. She did not have what is commonly understood to be a good thing, both feet on the ground. Neither of her feet is on the ground. The shoes place her in a powder pigeon position with her chest stick that sticks out and her spine is constantly struggling to achieve a kind of balance. In the set of masochist romance, Madonna's male part is fully clothed. Both his feet are on the ground. He does not look to be in pain. Madonna is only half clad and her dress plays peekaboo with her breasts as if she's in a strip club. Of course, she has makeup, her hair is long and bleached. The man's suit here is dignified. It's not figure hugging, comfortable, can easily, can easily conceal body fat. He doesn't need a corset. It's the clothing of power. Such a display, and this is entirely normal today, raises the question of how heterosexuality could ever possibly be a sexuality of equality. It demonstrates well that women's sexuality under male domination is groomed to be the eroticizing of women's subordination and male sexuality, the eroticizing of dominance. What else could happen between these two? Certainly not a sexuality of equality when one is half naked and can hardly move. Now, this is Nancy Pelosi crippled at work. She's in her eighties. Um, today, the wearing of crippling shoes is normal for elite women amongst whom I include top politicians, politicians' wives, such as Brigitte Macron, pop culture celebrities, television presenters, news readers. They set the tone and they are the role models for girls. Here, Nancy Pelosi is almost unable to walk, but determined to wear these crippling shoes whilst performing the duties of her work. She may be unable at this point to wear flat shoes or walk easily because crippling shoes do cripple in the long run. And in the end, many women are unable to walk in any shoes but these shoes and cannot otherwise walk at all. She's now in her 80s, she's thin. She would likely suffer serious injury if she fell, but as she hobbles about, a fall looks very likely. 
and it alarms me and doubtless others too. I cannot relax and I am sure she cannot. It's completely extraordinary that there should be this performance and look at the difference between her and any of the other men who are in this screen. Nobody is having to humiliate themselves in this fashion. So I will conclude. Transvestism has always been a product of the hatred of women, the exploitation of women's oppression for men's satisfaction, but it's not new. I've read a great deal of the psychological and criminological literature about transvestism from the late 19th century onwards. It was always a practice deeply insulting to women and doubtless often traumatic for these men's wives, but the men were ashamed of it. And for decades, it was illegal for men to cross-dress in public. They dressed in their bedrooms or bathrooms, went away for cross-dressing weekends and read their cross-dressing fan club magazines in private. It was only in the 1990s that transvestite activists created a liberation movement for the expression of their sexual fetish. It is not possible to dismantle the edifice, the edifice that transvestites have created, unless we attack the notion of gender that founds male domination. The notion of gender that underlies the transvestite movement is that men and women are in some fashion fundamentally different different in a way which causes women to like to be exposed in public and to walk in pain, whereas men just naturally do not. It is the culture and politics of male domination that construct transvestism, and this culture needs to be overturned, completely transformed. Dworkin analyzes beauty in her book, Woman Hating, as just one aspect of the way women are hated in male supremacist culture. And she indicts woman hating culture for the deaths, violations, and violence done to women, and says that feminists must look for ways of destroying culture as we know it, rebuilding it as we can imagine it. I think the word destroying is strong. It's a good word, it's a crucial word. We're not talking about tinkering at the edges of culture. Tinkering at the edges will not do. We have to bring down the idea of natural masculinity and femininity. They are the behaviors of the dominance of the missive classes, not something created by biology and not something caused by choice. Meanwhile, whenever I write or speak about these practices of subordination at this time, there are many women who are affronted. There are women who say, why on earth do we have to talk about this sort of thing when we're facing an existential threat? Can't we just talk about what is important? Some say that I'm criticizing them and that is woman hating. Although of course, I'm not criticizing any individual women. I have no idea most of the time what any of them are wearing when I am talking. I'm making a political analysis. I understand why they say these things, but I do not think their sensibilities can be protected from feminist theory. It is crucial that we do an analysis of beauty practices, even if there are women who get quite upset by that criticism. If the culture of misogyny is not overturned, transvestism will continue. It might be shoved out of the public eye as it was before, though that is hard to even imagine now. But men will engage in this behavior as long as women are required to wear a uniform which demonstrates our subordinate status. And as long as the new wave of feminism determinedly omits the criticism of beauty practices from their analysis. Somebody was saying it's lovely to see women defeminize. And I think we were so excited <clears throat> about defeminizing in the 70s and what it did for us that I can remember I had a party in my flat in Putney in the late 70s, which we, I called a before and after party. We'd all defeminized and we all had short hair and so on and so on. So, on. Um, so women all brought two photos. One of the photos was of them before they defeminized, so that uh, being getting married or out at a party when they were heterosexual and 19 or whatever. And so we put the uh, photos on the walls, the, the before photos on one wall and the after photos on other walls, and it, the job was to match them up. It was absolutely mm -hmm. hilarious, of course. Everybody had hysterics and fell about uh, because everybody looked so extraordinarily different and we all looked so extraordinarily absurd to our new feminist eyes in the very strange costumes we'd worn before. So I do advise this as a practice, as you are defeminizing, as I know so many of you are and so many of you will have before and after parties for the laughs. It's really worthwhile. It's really worthwhile. But one of the thing I did, things I did notice was that a couple of the comments in the chat, women are saying, yes, but not this or not that sort of beauty practice, or they're giving the impression that we, you know, we don't have to be wholesale 
in our abolition of beauty practices and our opposition to them. So you can have a little bit of inequality um, on women and women can choose to do a little bit of showing their inequality. I don't think that's okay, really. I know women probably feel um, very much that they need to say this because they're determined not to stop wearing the makeup or whatever it is that they do. But honestly, I was trying to say we actually need to destroy the culture and we have to get rid completely of agenda. I don't want a bit of it. As I said, fiddling around the edges won't do it. So that's all I've really got to say is that it's amazing how over and over again women say just a little bit. Can I have a little bit of inequality on my face, on my feet? I don't really think that's on. So thank you, everyone, for listening. OK, well, we're going to move on now to our next, our second speaker, who is Anne Menashe. And if you have questions for Sheila, put them into the chat or, or the Q&A and we'll get Sheila back on at the end to, to talk again a bit more. So Anne Menashe is from the USA. She's a radical feminist, lesbian, socialist, civil rights lawyer, co-founder of Feminists in Struggle and Green Alliance for sex-based rights. Uh, she's been on Feminist Question Time before and also is very well known as an activist uh, and feminist, etc. So many of you will know her. Um, so uh, welcome back, Anne. And uh, you're going to talk about uh, being cancelled and how you're fighting back. So thank you so much for speaking to us and um, over to you. I've had a la uh, very difficult past six months after I was fired in May of 2022. Um, and, but to know that I have a movement, I'm part of a movement that I'm not alone, it makes a huge difference. So I was fired for feminism. And um, <clears throat> what I was trying to do uh, to try to cope with that uh, was to understand it and then to figure out how to fight back. So um, I, this is a, a picture uh, from the Salem witch, witch trials. Uh, it's a representation of that. So I've been reading up on Salem I've been reading up on McCarthyism uh, so uh, to try to understand what happened to me. So May 11th, I was fired without warning after almost 20 years as a civil rights attorney. It came to as a surprise even to me. Um, and the reason for my firing was my outside feminist political activity with Feminists in Struggle, including my participation on uh, one of these webinars. Um, and um, for declaring that abortion bans harm women as a sex. And so I was trying to figure out how something like this could happen uh, by a liberal civil rights employer and what exactly was going on. And so what I'm trying to do is inform people about what happened to me to understand this in context of other periods of American history when witch hunts have occurred and to help organize a fight back on behalf of myself and the many other women and some men whose jobs and livelihoods are being threatened today simply because they speak out for the sex-based rights of women and girls. Um, and also uh, because my, uh, my statements were concerned abortion, um, I also wanna talk about how important the right to safe, legal and accessible abortion is uh, to women, a right that has been stolen recently by the Supreme Court. So what's a witch hunt? I was uh, reading up on different uh, periods in history where people were fired and scapegoated and, and demonized and trying to see the commonality. So I put this list together myself. Uh, one is uh, one common theme is the demonization of a group with little power and exaggerating their power uh, and presenting them as extremely dangerous and the epitome of evil. But there's also the factor of a preemptive strike um, because I thought, well, you know, uh, women are pretty weak, weak right now, but potentially we could be really strong. And that was true also uh, during the uh, periods of, of uh, militant trade unionism and, and the stronger socialist left. There was also the fear that they could become stronger. Misogyny, certainly in the case of the witch hunt against feminism right now, and the pattern of older women as targets, which is really interesting. That was true in the Salem witch trials. Authoritarianism, fear, and intimidation uh, uh, as an attempt to silence opponents, political opponents, scapegoating to divert attention to real causes of problems, 
uh, the, the, the witch hunting is not just an act of one employer or one individual. It's, there's a mass aspect to it. It's a bullying. It's a, there has to be some level of mass participation or going along with the witch hunt. Guilt by association, anyone who defends a witch or associates with the witch is obviously a witch. So everyone wants to you know, not get near people who've been labeled as such. Punishment for thought crimes, uh, basically having wrong think, uh, having ideas that are not accepted. And that of course has a chilling effect on free speech for everyone. Convention, uh, conviction without due process or on what's, what was called during the Salem witch trial, spectral evidence, spectral evidence being that um, you, uh, basically you could, your, your words or your, just your eyes could attack someone from afar in spirit and, and torment the, the victim. That, that's, that's the idea of spectral evidence. And I think I was convicted of, <laughs> on the basis of spectral evidence. And then um, naming names and uh, condemning witches in order to avoid suspicion falling on oneself. So there's been a lot of witch hunts in the history of the United States. These are just a few of the most uh, significant ones. Uh, of course, the Salem witch trials in 1692, 1693. The Red Scare during World War I and into the early 1920s that targeted socialists, the uh, IWW, anarchists, immigrants, union activists, and anti-war protesters. The McCarthy era, which is the most well-known with the Red Scare, loyalty oaths, blacklisting, anti-communist and anti-gay witch hunts. Uh, that went from the late 1940s into the 50s. Ongoing anti-lesbian witch hunts in the military from the time of the 1950s through about 2010. Um, the no platform, and the currently, the no platforming of leftists and anti-war journalists from mainstream publications and social media. Um, Chris Hedges would be an example who was um, iced from the New York Times for being against the Iraq war. And then, of course, what's going on now with Julian Assange, and then uh, the contemporary uh, turf hunting, turf hunting of gender critical feminists that happened to me and many other women currently. So, what is it about the nonprofit world? I have been immersed in the nonprofit legal world for actually more than 20 years. Um, I worked for Legal Aid before working for Disability Rights California. What is it about that? Um, that would allow for this to happen? I mean, is there a reason, is there certain, are there certain uh, milieus and certain jobs that would um, uh, be ripe for these kind of witch hunts? And I think there are actually. Um, it seems that women uh, who work in professional settings, lawyers or authors, artists and university professors, fields where women have made the most gains since the second wave are the primary targets for modern day anti-feminist witch hunts. Now the nonprofit legal world is overwhelmingly female, um, with, in, including the attorneys, uh, overwhelmingly female attorneys, and of course the support staff, many women of color. And the reason, the main reason for this is that women have significantly less opportunity as lawyers in private practice or in the, the uh, law firms. Um, women are found, lawyers are found in um, the government positions and in the nonprofit world primarily. Um, and of course, they're still male dominated. Uh, there are some men and the few men that are there are disproportionately found in upper management and often do have greater opportunities for advancement uh, than the women who work there. I think there's some other uh, characteristics of the, of the nonprofit world, um, a tendency to micromanagement, which basically limits the opportunities of the women who work there. They are mostly non-union in the United States at will employment. So there's very few rights for staff and um, gender ideology and a corporate style diversity, equity and inclusion have gained a strong foothold as they cost nothing and eliminate the troublesome category of sex and, and uh, they keep the staff in, in their various silos. So how is it that the civil rights organization, has, which has done really good work, and I'm very proud of the work I've done uh, as, uh, when I was employed at DRC, how is it that it was so captured by this ideology that ref a reference to biological sex 
was, uh, was interpreted as transphobic hate speech. How, do, how did that happen? Now, the organization I work for, DRC, Disability Rights California, is the largest nonprofit legal firm in California. And it has a really good reputation for fighting for people with disabilities. And uh, again, is, is in many respects typical of the nonprofit legal world that I, I talked about uh, earlier. Corporate style diversity training um, started happening. I guess there's always been diversity training, but they've changed, it's changed hugely. Much more use of corporate consultants, the same people who advise McDonald's about diversity <laughs> um, have been involved in, um, in training the nonprofits uh, and particularly at least the Disability Rights California. And those trainings uh, started started with you know trainings that were about uh, sexual harassment and racism and you know expecting respecting people's various ethnicities uh, to uh, this extreme ideological training that told us that that sex didn't exist basically that it was an invention of well, this is almost a direct quote invention of um, uh, white colonialism <laughs> and um, so uh, gender or gender identity uh, started being substituted for sex. Um, and so uh, the, and this is just a develop, development that started happening just the last few years where there was a focus on pronouns. Um, you were urged to uh, list your pronouns on signature lines um, and a asking any questions or disagreeing with any of this or declining to declare your pronouns, even though you weren't technically required to do so. Of course, I didn't would label you a transphobe. Um, and I was actually labeled a transphobe a few years earlier during a diversity training because I asked some questions and also said that my lesbianism was sex-based. My, my orientation was toward women and as a sex, and I was called transphobic for that. So this was starting to build up uh, a few years earlier. So my crime, what was my crime? It's a pretty bizarre story. <laughs> um, Right at the time when the Dobbs decision was leaked, uh, uh, and that's the decision that, that uh, ultimately uh, overturned the right to abortion, uh, the Roe v. Wade decision, it was leaked. Uh, the executive director, who's a man, announced on the, uh, all, our all staff email list that our agency had made a public statement in support of Roe v. Wade. Uh, they released the statement we had been released already to the public, released a statement to our staff and invited comment, explicitly invited con comment. The statement mentioned every possible group that might conceivably impact, be impacted by a reversal of role, except women. Quote, the reversal, re reversal would disproportionately negatively impact the most vulnerable populations, including people with disabilities, people of color, people living in poverty and those without the means of travel. And this was purposeful, uh, later was clarified that it was purposeful to be quote unquote inclusive, i.e. exclude females. So I responded on May 6th, so glad DRC came up with a statement in defense of Roe, thank you. Access to safe legal abortion is a life and death necessity for women as a biological sex across the board, regardless of race, economic class, gender identity, sexual orientation, even lesbians can be raped or anything else and an absolute prerequisite for equal female participation in society. Of course, the most vulnerable females, especially poor women, women of color, women with disabilities, young girls, unhoused women and girls, women and girls in prison, et cetera, will suffer the most under draconian anti-abortion laws. As a veteran of the feminist struggle for abortion rights that preceded Roe, I never thought it would come to this. Thanks again, DRC, for taking a stand. That was the crime. It was a big taboo that I broke. <laughs> I was immediately reprimanded by a person high in the agency. Quote, many people whose gender is not female can become pregnant and DRC's all staff email list is no place to circulate statement that try to erase that. And then 
the full onslaught began. I was called all the names you'd expect. I was a turf, a hate monger. And my seemingly mild language, a quote unquote dog whistle that would result in serious violence and stigma against trans people who need abortions. Like in the Salem witch trials, my thoughts and words were supposed to have secret meeting and be so powerful that I could torment my victims from afar. And then the, the person who uh, started viciously attacking me um, had already been doing uh, research on me and uh, had gone online and, and listened to my videos and, and um, included statements I made on Feminist Question Time, which of course were taken out of context to defame me as a hateful and bigoted person. I tried to clarify, I was talking about sex and not gender and asked that this be discussed off list. And privately, I did receive statements of sympathy and support from several coworkers. So then things moved rapidly. That was Friday. By Monday, um, there was a, a meeting behind my back, I was not invited to, by the, the uh, group of lawyers and support staff for, that work on civil rights cases. And it was called the CH Civil Rights Practice Group. Um, and found me guilty as charged. We disability, this is a quote from, from the uh, condemnation of me. We, Disability Rights California Civil Rights Group, want to clearly state we support, value, and celebrate our trans colleagues. We reject any actions that would deny or minimize their full identities. The members of this team acknowledge the threat to civil rights presented by the May 6th All Staff Correspondence. The opinion expressed by one of our current members does not reflect the civil rights practice group's values or mission. So I responded pretty strongly um, after that. Um, I said that this was homophobic and McCarthy-like and, and I tried to explain my position as a gender non-conforming or non-femininity uh, performing, I guess would be the way Sheila would maybe say it, lesbian. <laughs> And, it, it, and also clarified that I supported everyone's rights, but believed it was important to maintain sex and sexual orientation, of course, as a distinct protected class. That was Monday. Two days later, on May 11th, I was fired by text message while I was sitting in the dentist office, actually, uh, a text message from management. Subsequently, my employer denied my unemployment benefits on the basis of my alleged misconduct and abuse that threatened the safety of my trans coworkers. So I have decided to fight back, to speak up. I, I feel like as an uh, older person at the tail end of my career, though I was nowhere near planning to retire, um, I was in a better position to do so. Um, I do have uh, social security. <laughs> so even though I didn't have unemployment, and um, uh, I think for a younger woman, it would be more difficult. So I, I feel like I needed to fight back for myself and also for everyone else who's being threatened and whose who's jobs and livelihoods are being threatened for being feminists, basically. Um, witch hunts only end when enough people speak out and say enough is enough. That's what happened uh, during the McCarthy era. A few people said enough is enough. Uh, and so that's what has to happen. Uh, I have um, working with uh, people that I, I work with in, in, in FIST and in the Green Alliance, uh, we formed a committee, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Justice for Me Committee, <laughs> Justice for Anne Committee. Um, we are circulating a statement of solidarity that we want to get signatures on. We're, we will be seeking organizational endorsements shortly. Um, and um, the, the websites I've listed here on the, on the screen are the websites that you can keep on top of what's going on. I have also hired an attorney and I do expect to be filing a lawsuit very shortly. So I get inspired by, by the slogans and I'm just gonna read some of my favorite ones. <laughs> um, remember the dignity of your womanhood. Do not, pe do not appeal. Do not beg, do not grovel, take courage, 
join hands, stand beside us, fight with us. That's from Christabel Pankhurst. And then, of course, sisterhood is powerful, which it is. An injury to one is an injury to all, which is a statement from uh, the IWW. And then a statement uh, during the McCarthy Army, the Army McCarthy hearings by Joseph Welch to Senator Joseph McCarthy on June 9th, 1954. Have you no sense of decency? And that's what I say to DRC. Have you no sense of decency? Enough is enough. Yeah, that's me, the witch, the wicked witch of the West here. <laughs> um, and uh, this is just the beginning of my fight back. And I hope that it, it helps not only uh, getting justice for myself, but also for all the other women and some men who are uh, being victimized by our contemporary witch hunt against feminism. So we're now going to go to Susan Smith, who is from Four Women Scotland, and she's going to give us some information about Scotland. Thank you so much, Susan, and over to you. I've had a rather full on week, um, professionally, personally, and in terms of what we're trying to do with Four Women Scotland. So um, I, I'm, I'm, this is slightly flying by the seat of my pants. Um, but um, we are reaching a bit of an end point in Scotland now with um, the GRR bill going into the final stages in the Scottish Parliament. Um, Nicola Sturgeon and the government have continued to press on in the teeth of a rebellion from MSPs in the stage one debate and a particularly heavyweight intervention from the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and Girls, who um, said that this uh, would open the door to predatory and dangerous men and urged them to wait the outcome of court cases, um, one, of, one of which is ours. Um, so for those who are not aware, the background is that the GRA was passed um, as a piece of UK legislation in 2004. Um, an ongoing problem has been the seeds were sown in that piece of legislation because of a deliberate conflation um, between sex and gender. And um, there is a part of that act, um, section nine, which says that um, this changes a person's sex. Um, but there are actually two parts of section nine, and this was this was important in our very recent JR, which I'll come on to. Um, that part one of section nine says that it changes a person's sex, but part um, three of section nine says, except in certain certain circumstances. Um, what what you know, and it's never been spelled out how we how we organise that and how we look at that. And then, of course, subsequently, we have the Equality Act, which is the major piece of UK legislation dealing with equality law and the interactions between the Equality Act and how the Equality Act defines sex has been one of the ongoing um, discussions that um, women in the UK, activists in the UK have been having with various governments. So um, to go back to to go back to Nicola. Um, what uh, Rui Mel Salem, the special rapporteur, said um, was very similar to what the government had been told by the EHRC, which they had also brushed off. And it's becoming increasingly clear that the Scottish government is not open to reason, is not open to any form of expertise on this, that they have made, dug into a position and they are in an incredibly bloody minded fashion refusing to budge on this. Her comments about um, Remel Salem were rude and dismissive. She called her um, that the person from the UN. Um, and very entertainingly, I don't know if you saw, but um, Sal Salem then changed her Twitter bio and um, said, you know, a UN special rapporteur, AKA that person from the UN, which, um, was a particularly, uh, well, we found that a particularly entertaining response to um, Nicola Sturgeon's rudeness. What she's done is she's fallen back onto the funded groups um, in Scotland. Most of 
um, the women's sector is funded directly by the government. So organisations like Scottish Women's Aid, Rape Crisis Scotland, Zero Tolerance, Engenda, etc., get over 90% of their money from the Scottish government and have they have always been remarkably in step with what Nicola Sturgeon says um, should be happening. And they wrote a joint letter um, which was extraordinary in its inanity if if you'd been coming to it fresh but having been around these organizations for a while it was quite typical of them they um, they insist that they have never had any problems with trans inclusion over 15 years um, Nicola Sturgeon likes to make out that the groups who signed this letter work as she said day in and day out on the front line they don't um, and gender do no frontline work, for example. One of the organisations, Just Right Scotland, is actually a lawyer, um, a legal organisation, which is, again, part funded by the government to bring cases to court. They were the people who represented Equality Network when they intervened in the first JR, that uh, judicial review that we brought against the Scottish government. Um, they also have a remit, apparently, that they will be bringing cases, they want to bring test cases on behalf of trans people who have been excluded from single sex um, provisions or jobs. So these are people with a really, really seriously ideological um, impetus to push this legislation through. The other organisations who signed this letter, Scottish Amnesty International, again, do no frontline work in Scotland, and Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland, who Oh, are the ones that most people assume do, but actually these are umbrella organisations. We are very much hoping that we're going to see more of the women on the front line speaking out because ever since we have been in existence, what we have heard are women who work directly with survivors saying that the views of the head office do not represent them, but they have been very they, they have, there is a culture of bullying. I mean, Rape Crisis Scotland have actually been taken to court because they've bullied staff on this subject. So it, it is shocking that this is happening within the women's sector in Scotland and that there is a bullying of women who step out of line. Um, that all rather came to a head um, this week as well. Um, I don't know if you saw the film of a woman at the Zero Tolerance um, event. Zero Tolerance, again, funded by Scottish Government, and they were celebrating 30 years. 30 years ago, they did a campaign about violence against women. They have black and white pictures. They put up everywhere. There was a lot of um, support. Um, and their their, their campaign was really to encourage people to be bold, to bring this conversation about violence against women, domestic abuse, into the public spaces, to bring it onto the streets, to bring it into the workplace, to bring it into the centres of power, and to talk about what happened to women, and to be outspoken. And for their 30th anniversary, they had Nicola Sturgeon addressing um, the, the meeting, and they sent round an email beforehand saying that women were not allowed to ask about the definition of women or about single sex basis. So they have gone from being this really radical campaign to um, people who were just trying to appease some of the people in the room as it turned out. And funnily enough, those people whose feelings they were very keen to appears were a couple of individuals who are trans-identified males, one of whom is the current CEO of Edinburgh Rape Crisis, um, and he was at the meeting. So um, having sent this email out, um, we also understood that it, they were stopping people on the door as they came in who they thought might cause trouble. The audience was largely hand-picked, um, I suppose there are a lot of people within the sector who are aware who, who the people are who've got concerns. Um, a couple of women said, well, we are going to ask something and they were told to leave. Um, another couple of women got in. I know one of them is part of, part of the women's declaration and she was not the woman who, who stood up, but she did 
uh, managed to speak to Sturgeon and um, Sturgeon's response, which is Sturgeon's stock response, was that this has been introduced in many countries and there has never been any problems. Now, I know that you know none better that this is not true. Um, but what has happened during committee stages um, is that any, any conversation about international examples have been dismissed as anecdotes. So the committee's report came out and said there were no concrete examples of harm from other countries. Um, and while we and groups like Murray Blackman McKenzie have tried to stress that it is almost impossible to give official um, recorded data about harms caused by self-ID, when none of these countries are collecting that data officially, um, that, that has been ignored. You cannot, you cannot prove something if people are not collecting the data. So um, th this is Nicola Sturgeon's line that nothing bad ever happens in other countries. And of course, um, this did so incense this, this other woman that she did stand up and shouted, shame on you, Sturgeon. Um, and, and it is, it's, it's an incredibly depressing um, film in a way, but in another way, Sturgeon did admit that most men would not take advantage of this, but some would. So this is only what most of us have been saying for the past five years and have been called bigots and turfs. Sturgeon said exactly the same thing. Some people will take advantage of this. But she also, in effect, said that that was a price worth paying, that women's safety and dignity um, and the erosion of, of our human rights was a price worth paying for keeping some of these people who she claims are the most marginalized in society happy. So, um, where do we go now? Well, despite a lot of promises to look at this bill in stage two, um, it, there have been no real amendments made. This bill was first brought, um, brought to the table in um, at, at five years ago, about five years ago now. Um, the government say, this length of time, actually that six years, they say the six years, the two consultations, the committee process means that it's been scrutinized, that nobody can accuse them of rushing. But this is pretty much identical to the bill that was introduced all that time ago and nothing has changed. All the arguments, all the consultations have made next to no impact. And, Although they promised to look at it in stage two, um, most of the amendments brought to committee were voted down. The committee is hugely ideologically captured. Um, they allowed only the most lukewarm of amendments. They would not even vote for an amendment that said perhaps convicted sex offenders should not be able to obtain a GRC. That is the, the level that they're at, that they cannot even bring themselves to have that the most minimal, and that really is the most minimal level of safeguarding within this bill. Um, this will go to stage three now, which is a general debate in the chamber. We know that they are determined to have that debate before Christmas. Um, there has been some suggestion that they might try to do it on the very last day of the parliamentary session, which um, for, obvious re for obvious reasons, because a lot of the parliamentarians will want to be going home for Christmas. They will want, not want to be sitting until late at night on the 22nd and 23rd of December. And um, this is a particularly simple way of trying to drive this through. Um, so we we do not know whether there will be more SNP rebels on this. We know that the rebels who are who have rebelled um, will hopefully continue to push on this because nothing has changed. We would hope Labour or some of Labour can find a spine before Christmas because 
we know that there's a lot of disquiet about this. But at the moment, they seem to have been the nodding dogs of the um, of the SNP, which is a, a bizarre position for an opposition party to take on a hugely unpopular and divisive bill, which might actually um, cause a bit of a dent and um, help their own election prospects, which would, it surely should be what an opposition party wants. Um, some of the Labour ex MSPs who are sorely missed um, because they're no longer in Holyrood have written um, to the UN Special Rapporteur themselves to express support. Um, and so, with any, I don't know that they will have any any influence on the rest of Labour, and I do not know whether um, the UN. Rapporteur will have any influence when she meets Shana Robertson next week, which she is going to do so. Um, one of her recommendations about waiting for the court case is in reference to the judicial review we brought, which was our second judicial review. Our first judicial review was in relation to a piece of legislation passed um, in 2018 called the Gender Representation on Public Boards Act. And this deliberately conflated the two protected characteristics in the Equality Act of Sex and gender reassignment and said that a woman for the purposes of the bill was anyone who was living as a woman. And the um, this, according to the guidance in the bill, did not require someone to, uh, to have undertaken any um, diagnosis of just dysphoria, to to um, have any sort of evidence or proof that they were doing this, but um, the, the only sort of guidelines issued were that they should be using a female name, whatever that might be, because I can think of several names that are pretty unisex, and um, be using female pronouns. That that was their, that was that that is their sole criteria for what a woman is in this piece of legislation or was. Um, so we took them we took them to the highest court in Scotland. And we won and we got that guidance struck out because they said it was beyond their legislative competence. They couldn't redefine protected characteristics in the Equality Act and that under the Equality Act, um, a woman was a, a female and that by definition measures to help women um, excluded biological males. The government then went back and rewrote the guidance. And this time they put in um, women covered people with the protected characteristic of sex as per the Equality Act and people with a GRC. Now, this slightly blew the doors off what they'd been saying to Parliament because the Scottish government's argument throughout the process of talking about increasing by about a hundredfold, they reckon, and that's probably a conservative estimate of the number of people who will get a GRC, is that it will make no difference because it confers no additional rights. Then the, now they were in court arguing that having a GRC changed your sex for all purposes under law. Um, as our KC pointed out, this would make a mockery of many pieces of legislation, including those on maternity rights um, and on abortion, because if woman was a word that referred to people who were biologically female, but also people who had a GRC, and if it excluded people who were biologically female and had a GRC, then these rights would not pertain anymore to just to the class of people who could get pregnant or have babies. So the Scottish government then tried to argue that these cases were different because who knows why um, and that everything had to be treated on its own merits. It, it becomes a bit of a it becomes a bit of a nonsense because essentially what they were saying was that every piece of legislation um, had to be weighed up on criteria which we do not know what they are, which we cannot attest to. And even within the Equality Act, they were saying that sex in the Equality Act referred to people with a GRC from most of the Act, except the part on maternity, where it only referred to people of the female sex. 
And th this was the argument that they were making in court. And um, as Ms. Al-Salam said, they really needed to wait for the outcome of this. You know, we might lose this. We might lose it. And it might be that the Scottish court will come back and say, yes, sex in UK law does mean people with a GRC. It will be interesting to see what happens if it does, because um, that may well put pressure on the UK government to step up and try to clarify this, because it will show that the GRA, the original GRA, was an incredibly dangerous piece of legislation if it really does open the way for people to for, for this to for this to be the case. So that's a bit of a brief outline of the court case. It's more complicated. There's a lot more to it, um, but it it shows why many people think it's important that the legislators in the Scottish Parliament are not making law blind because. Um, if they don't know and if the government is not willing to set out what they believe and they haven't been willing to set out what they believe, they were asked repeatedly during the first stage one debate if the minister believed that a GRC changed somebody's sex under the Equality Act. Um, one of the Labour members of the committee st stood up and said she did, which I think probably through the deputy leader of Labour who had suggested that this would be a problem if this was the assumption. So there's a huge mess, not only within the SNP, but within other parties as to what they believe this thing does. Um, beyond that, we have ongoing issues within the NHS. We have new SPATH guidance, which has been issued, which is the new body they've set up because NHS Scotland got into trouble for putting WPATH guidance on their NHS website because of the links to the um, UNIC archives and the extreme nature of the WPATH guidance. Instead, what they've done is they've basically rewritten most of it and called it SPATH, um, but it continues to have some of the more extreme elements about um, access to surgery, age of treatment, and so on that WPATH has. So while CAS review has made made this the situation a bit better down south in Scotland the situation in the NHS and within the um, gender identity service particularly for children is still pretty bleak unfortunately and um, with the proposals in this bill which is that the age be lowered to 16 and and incidentally we think this was a potentially a point that the government might have budged on, but it was not a point that their partners in the Scottish Greens were ever prepared to budge on. The Scottish Greens would be quite happy to get rid of age limits altogether or reduce them to 12. So um, I think there was some surprise. I think even some of the groups pushing for this were prepared to have the, the age limit left as it is. So what we have is a particularly extreme version still in existence of this bill. And um, that tied up with the extreme um, policies that are still being pushed in the NHS does make the situation still, unfortunately, very difficult in Scotland. The, um, the checks that are done on people, um, background checks, um, we, we're in a situation where um, the, the UK government is actually looking at policies which will prevent sex offenders from changing their name because we know a lot of sex offenders change their name in order to um, evade scrutiny and then go on to re-offend. Um, of course, getting a GRC means that um, you get an even greater level of protection because there's something in the um, GRA called Section 22, which affords people this level of privacy that is only really otherwise afforded to you if you're on the Witness Protection Program. So it's very hard to find out information about somebody's past life if they have a GRC. So we're in this bizarre position where um, people are worried about sex offenders changing their names, but they're not so concerned about them changing their um their name and their sex and also because what they also can do now is they can change their marriage certificate so they can really completely obliterate all this all this documentation about them and then 
they can they they will be able to go on to change again we know of at least one person in scotland who has already been through the process twice so they went um they they a, a male who got a grc saying they were female and now we understand that this person has change back to male but under a different name and a different identity so both those previous identities then are locked up so it's a when when Sturgeon talks about international comparisons one of the things that she keeps forgetting is that most countries do not have um, something equivalent to section 22. And we're just now going to hear uh, from Vicky Lax, who's been uh, launching, uh, a, along with lots of other of, a, of us, a Primark campaign. Um, and then we'll go, get all the panellists back on and we can hear a few more words from them. So thanks very much for coming, Vicky. And um, if you maybe tell us about the campaign, how it's going. I guess it feels really sobering, if I can just say this, having just listened to Susan talking. Um, I've tried to walk personally a line. But I don't think I can anymore. And we need to be really clear when we started or when I started um, the work I wanted to do to drive the change that I wanted around Primark, it was around predatory men in singles in, in what are mixed sex changing rooms. But let's have absolutely no doubt that the Scottish government would support and Primark would support an individual like Katie Dolotowski, a pedophile sex offender going into a space in any Primark in this country with women and girls in a state of undress. And that isn't OK. Um, so it feels very sobering, I think, to follow on from Susan and huge solidarity uh, to the women in Scotland. I guess it's also fair to say that the action we've taken today has been supported unstintingly by Women's Declaration International, by Joe and Bernadette, by the Northern Rad Femme Network, by Locals for Women and by Standing for Women. And for them, I am hugely grateful, as well as the many women across Scotland who supported this today. What we are seeking to do is to ask Primark to reinstate single sex spaces being absolutely no doubt it is it is beyond doubt now that their definition of women is based on gender identity i've sat with the top team in the uk and they've confirmed it to me we've stood in my own local primark and they've agreed it so if a man identifies as a woman he will be allowed in no questions asked primark are well aware as are their parent company of the lengths that predatory men go to to access women and girls. It's happened in their changing rooms, it's happened in their stores. Um, we aren't suggesting, um, you know, we're very clear on what the evidence is and what the evidence isn't, and there's a lot of work going on. But women today across the UK have joined together in an action that started at midday to talk to um, people shopping in Primark to make people aware of exactly, um, you know, what Primark's policy is. Um, and the response that we've had on social media has been fantastic. And the response that women have had uh, from the people that they've talked to has also, I think, reaffirmed our belief that we are not a minority um, people don't know what's going on. So um, I guess we need to take some time to reflect on that in, in, uh, in the UK. Um, what will be coming out with, again, fantastic support from WDI is that we'd like to understand what's happening in the other countries that Primark operate in. I've actually been contacted by somebody in the States today, I believe Chicago, with, um, you know, pretty much the same um you know the same set of circumstances that we're finding um in the UK so you know we're joining together um I think the contact details for, for myself are provided fairly regularly by um Joe which again I'm hugely grateful for but um you know thank you to everyone who's taken part um today all of our lives are really busy but two weeks ago Three 12-year-old girls in Scotland 
were fooled by a sign that said women into going into what they thought was a single sex changing room and they tried clothes on. It was a mixed sex space. I've raised that concern with Primark and Associated British Foods. They haven't even had the courtesy to acknowledge it. Um, I don't have children, but I remember my first shopping trip at Tammy Girl, for those of us that are of a similar age and will remember that. And it was, you know, it was a fabulous experience. And it is terrifying to know that these young women and girls are not consenting to being in a mixed sex space. They think it's a female only space. So more to follow. What's next? So in terms of immediate next steps on um, Friday, the 9th of December it is the uh, annual annual general meeting of Associated British Foods and they are. Um, the owner of Primark. I'm a shareholder, so uh, I am planning to go. I'm just waiting for my invite and Standing for Women are um, taking some action there. I guess one of the things in terms of next steps is we need to keep the noise up on this. Not every woman can afford to boycott Primark. I sat on their earnings call And we need to be really, really clear that one of the things that's driving their results at the moment is that lots of people, including women, are buying more items of clothing rather than putting their central heating on. I so I we all have to make our own choices and it isn't for me to tell any woman or indeed man what they should or shouldn't do, but write to them tell them they've got contact forms but as I say it's the AGM on Friday so um, you know keep um, keep your eye out for for what's going on around that we need to raise our voices globally which really probably is the next thing and to keep maintaining um, our position on this in the UK that's brilliant thank you so much thank you everyone let's um let's keep going Thank you.